religion is really not good for you. You know, like marriage. They're both not good for you. They're both too pretentious, too artificial, too regulated, too impersonal. What has happened to marriage has happened to religion, and what has happened to religion has happened to marriage. Because religion is supposed to be a relationship with God, and it turned into a religion. And marriage is supposed to be a relationship between husband and wife, but it turned into a marriage. These are problems. So let's examine each of them. Chai Elul, as already mentioned, breathes new life into the month of Elul. In fact, into, into Judaism in general. And why do we need new life? Because we've become a religion. When you become a religion, the intimacy of the relationship suffers. It's, it's too programmed. Not that there's anything wrong with the program. Like if you're a wife and you make breakfast every morning, it's a good program. But if you forget who you're married to, making breakfast is going to become a burden. It's going to lose its appeal. It's going to become distasteful. Without the excitement, the life, the high of who you're dealing with or who you are serving, the service becomes clunky, awkward, lifeless, both in Judaism and in marriage. Because the way we relate to God, that's how we will relate to each other. And the way we relate to each other, that's how we relate to God. Some guy was telling me, I object to religion. I don't, I, don't, I don't accept God telling me what to do. I said, are you married? <laughs> he says, not anymore. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> the way one goes, the other goes. So let's take a look at what the Baal Shem Tov introduced that revolutionized all of Judaism. We're told that at uh, the giving of the Torah, <coughs> the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, God's plan was that Moshe would go up the mountain. God would speak to Moshe, but the people will hear. The Chol Ha'om Shemim. Moshe comes to the people and says, here's the plan. I'm going to go up the mountain. God's going to speak to me. You guys listen. And they said, no. We want to see God. We want him to talk to us directly. So God said, see me? Nice, but no. You want me to talk to you directly? Okay. Okay. Let's try it. So God said the first of the ten, first two of the Ten Commandments directly to the people. They fainted and they said, uh, not a good idea. Talk to Moshe, we'll listen. They wanted to see God and God said no. Why? And it's not that we can't see him. God is the creator. The world is the creation. If you can see the creation, if it's real enough to see, then the creator must be more real. So if you can see the table, you can certainly see its creator. So there's no reason for us not to be able to see God. So why won't he let us? Why does he refuse? So here's a, 
a detail in the definition of intimacy. Intimacy means the ability that a human being has to connect to another human being, to connect, to merge with another human being, to blur the borders between one and the other. Seeing does not do that. We know that seeing is very powerful. Seeing is believing. But believing is not intimate. That's why in Judaism, believing in God is not, not a big deal. Because even if you believe, that, that's not intimacy. You believe in things that are far, inaccessible, unknowable. That's not closeness. That's not intimate. So seeing does not bring you closer. In fact, it distracts you. You can stare at a person for hours on end. You have no idea who you're staring at. Because the eye only sees things, objects. It does not see personality. So God said, I'm going to talk to you. You want to see me? You don't understand what I'm after. I don't want to impress you. I don't want to blow you away with how infinite and glorious and awesome I look. Because you'll be very impressed for a week or two, and then you'll get over it. And our relationship will be finished. I don't want that kind of relationship. If you want me, hear me, know me, that's a relationship. That can soften the borders that separate us. But seeing doesn't do that. So God said, I can, I can impress you with what I look like but I want to be related to you forever. So listen, hear me. The same is true with marriage. Seeing each other is not intimate. Hearing each other, that's intimate. So what did the Baal Shem Tov say? When God came down to Mount Sinai, he wasn't looking for religion. He wasn't asking us to be religious. He was asking us to be his. Be mine. Now, if you're thinking in that, in that, along that line, who is closer to God, the scholar or the simple Jew? The scholar has got too much stuff between him and God. To the simple Jew, God wants me, I am his, then he is mine. So when the simple Jew said, how am I feeling? Baruch Hashem. He meant it. He had no airs about it. He knew that he was fine because God takes care. And if you ask the simple Jew, what do you mean by God? What would he say? Say the God of Avraham, the God of Yitzchak. What, what, what's the question? Ask a scholar, what do you mean by God? You can't get to a final answer. Sometimes God is like this, sometimes he's like that. Too many things. So it turns out that emunna doesn't really mean belief and it doesn't mean faith. Emuna really means familiar. Familiar. 
When we say animamin, it doesn't mean I think, I hope, I believe, I trust, I'm guessing. <laughs> now, emuna means what I am most familiar with. What am I most familiar with? God of Avraham, the God of Yitzchak, the God of Yaakov, the God of my parents. Familiar. We're old friends. That's how it should be. That's what God is looking for. Who responds properly to that proposal? A simple Jew. The Baal Shem Tev wanted the scholar to be jealous of the simple Jew and try to get as close to God as the simple Jews. And that learning, studying Torah, should not distance you. God should not become a fascinating subject because you're losing the intimacy. I do some marriage counseling. This husband says to me, we had problems, my wife and I, but it's much better now because I understand her. I said, does she think it's better now? It's probably worse, isn't it? You figured her out. Boy, is she in trouble. <laughs> you don't do that. Like one frustrated wife said to her husband during marriage counseling, look, you want to be right or do you want to be married? <laughs> you can't have both. Because if you need to be right, you are not ready to um, erase the border that separates us. You're maintaining the border. You are right. It's a terrible distancing effect. If you ask people, uh, what do you know about God? so sad. We've been in this relationship for 3,330 years. And you ask somebody, what do you know about God? And you don't get a straight answer. God is really unknowable. He's mysterious. He's After 3,000 years of the best minds studying his words, we have no idea who he is, what he is, what he wants. So, so let, me, let me turn everything upside down from the traditional way of thinking to the more Chabad way of thinking. Ask any student in a yeshiva, when it says in the Torah, God's right arm, does God have an arm? No. Does he have a right arm? There's no right, there's no left, there's no arm. No. It's a metaphor. It says in the Torah, God's mouth. Does he have a mouth? No, it's a metaphor. God got angry at whoever, whatever. Lots of people. God got angry. Did he really get angry? No, it's a metaphor. A lot of metaphors in the Torah every page. In fact, God said to Moshe, no, he didn't say, he doesn't have a mouth, he doesn't speak. It's a metaphor. <laughs> I think if you want a short list, show me the statements in Torah that are not metaphors. There are fewer of those than the metaphors. So it, I mean like Three quarters of the Torah is metaphor. And what is a metaphor? The scholars will tell you. Torah uses this language to help you understand, but don't take it literally. My problem with that is, <clears throat> if God doesn't have an arm, and you tell me he stretched out his arm, thank you, you really helped me understand. 
Understand what? You just lied to me. You made up a... What am I understanding? That he stretched his arm, but he doesn't have an arm. Well, that's, that's enlightening. Torah speaks in the language of the human. No. Torah speaks with a forked tongue. <laughs> it says arm and there's no arm. It says mouth and there's no mouth. It says anger, there's no anger. <clears throat> What's really upsetting is God doesn't get angry. God doesn't really love. God doesn't really, he's not jealous. He doesn't really care. It doesn't matter to him. He is perfect. He doesn't have an arm. He doesn't have eyes. He doesn't have a mouth. But watch it. Because he will get you so bad if you... This is very disturbing. What kind of God are we talking about? Coming now to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the traditional thinking is there's going to be a judgment. You better get your act together. These are days of awe, tremble. Because, you know, if you don't get your act together, you know what you deserve. You're going to get it. You're going to die. So you better come to the synagogue and plead with God to give you life. Zachreinu l'chayim, kasveinu besefer hachayim. Otherwise, you're going to die. Really? And my neighbor who doesn't come to shul, he's going to die too? Or only those who come to shul? <laughs> So you came to shul, you said, please, I don't want to die, but you didn't mean it. Now you're dead. Stay out of shul. Don't say anything. You'll be fine. It's a horrible chilul Hashem. If you say to your non-Jewish neighbor, I'm going to fast this Yom Kippur. I'm going to pray. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask God to forgive me because I don't want him to punish me for my sins or kill me. Your non-Jewish friend is going to think, what kind of a God do you have? When's the last time he spoke to you? Three, 3,000 years ago. Not since? No. Nothing? No. And what has happened during these 3,000 years? Had a good time? <laughs> well, not really. How about the last 2,000 years? Uh, not really. How about the last, the last century? Horrible. So God puts you through all of this, doesn't talk to you, and then if you sin, He's angry at you? What kind of God do you have? It's a chilul Hashem. And it's already done. It's already done. The world already has this impression that the God of Israel is impossible. So just this one thing. God spoke to us 3,300 years ago and said, here are a few things I need you to do. See you soon. <laughs> if you were God, how often would you gather the Jewish people at the foot of Mount Sinai? You know, like an update, reality check, progress report, just a reminder <laughs> once a month. That'd be a good idea. Not realistic? Okay, once a year. Once in 10 years? Once in a generation? Once in a millennium? No? You imagine the angel saying to God, um, I think you should talk to them. <laughs> uh, you know, remind them. It's 613. Come on, you can forget a few. And God is saying, they know I told them. It's quite a compliment. He doesn't feel a need to repeat himself. And the amazing thing is, you're sitting here tonight. 
This is crazy. God hasn't spoken to you ever. And you're sitting here? Why? You should be home watching Stissel. <laughs> Why are you here? Because you know that Rosh Hashanah is coming? Because you heard there's a Jewish program? Why are you here? Because you're Jewish. What makes you think you're Jewish? Why do you care that you're Jewish? What's the difference? It is absolutely miraculous. Not on God's part, on our part, that we are still Jewish. And we want to be. In fact, we want to be better Jews. This is, this is unbelievable. There is no rational excuse for your being here. Or anywhere Jewish. So, to say, I am worried about Yom Kippur because God is going to punish me because I, I, I uh, you know, ate what I shouldn't. I did some things I shouldn't have. It's a Chilul Hashem. What are you saying about God? That after all of this, he's going to blame you? This is called Judgment Day? This is no judgment at all. This is like a Russian court. You're guilty, come here, we'll punish you. The Baal Shem Tev came along and said, why do you assume that? What kind of thinking is this? The Baal Shem Tev says, God feels more responsible for your sin than you do. He's God. He runs the world. Of course, he gave you freedom of choice. But look at what he does to sway your choice. So, Yom Kippur means the day that God is desperate to forgive you. Not the day you need to be forgiven. Doesn't that add a little life to Yom Kippur? <laughs> but here's the real Hasidic twist. When we come on Yom Kippur and we ask God to write us into the book of life, to remember us for life and so on, we are not saying, I don't want to die. Because we're not going to die. That's paranoid. <laughs> what we're saying is, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of life. Dying is simple. Stupid people can die just as well as anybody else. But for life, you need some wisdom. Life is serious. Life is important. So what is Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah? Please write me into the book of life. I want to know how to live. Because I'm sure you're going to give me another year. I don't want to waste it. Like last year. So what we're davening for is not to remain alive. God owes us at least that. But what we want is to know how to live. There's a book of life. It's not just a list. <laughs> those who die, those who live. It's a book of life. Life is, is, is a subject. You have to study it. You have to understand it. You have to appreciate it. And you need the wisdom. That's what we're in awe of. These are days of awe, not because you might die. That's paranoid. It's days of awe because here comes another year. Are you ready to take responsibility for another year of life? Are you capable of making it better than last year? That's scary. That is awesome. Not death. So let's straighten this out. 
God gets angry or not. God has an arm or not. Is God as real as me? It's an important question, no? Because we're doing all this for him. And yet he doesn't seem to care. So what are we doing? So I was having this conversation with a very scholarly man, a real Talmud Chacham. I said, does God really need our service? Does he really need us to do these mitzvahs? And he said, no, God is perfect. I said, isn't that a little bit of a problem? Because, you know, we're like under the impression that we're serving him. <laughs> and if he's perfect, you can't really serve him. He says, if God is not perfect, I don't want to serve him. I said, I understand that. But then again, if God is perfect, you can't serve him. Where are you going to get him? Another tie? What's the story? And the same is true with marriage. When a man gets married, it's because he thinks he's perfect. And the woman who marries him is because she thinks he's perfect. And now they're going to get married and uh, be good to each other. But wait a minute, if you're perfect, I can't do anything for you. If you're not perfect, why would I want to marry you? Same dilemma, no? My granddaughter is playing with a doll. And the arm came out, came off. So she was crying. So I sit down with her and I say, Oy, did that hurt? So she starts to laugh. She says, it didn't hurt. I said, it didn't hurt? The arm came off. She says, it's not a real arm. I said, why not? She said, it's plastic. <clears throat> a real arm can't be made out of plastic. But then again, what is a real arm? If it has a bone, now it's a real arm. And if on the bone there is some skin, now it's a real arm, it's a bone. God doesn't really have an arm. I really have an arm. I got two problems with that. First of all, the Torah says that he has an arm. And secondly, I just realized that my arm isn't much of an arm. Because a real arm can split a seed. What can my arm do? So who's real? So when the Torah says God's arm, it means an arm. A literal arm? Yes. A real arm? Yes. An actual arm? Yes. You mean like mine? <laughs> no. Did you miss the word real? Yours is not real. Now it'll make a little sense. The Torah calls your arm Yad, and it calls God's arm Yad, but wait a minute. They're not the same. The answer is, it's a metaphor. It's a mashal. But we are the metaphor, not he. My arm is only a metaphor for the real thing. So why does God call my arm a yad? Because having an arm, although it's not a real one, gives you a little bit of an understanding what a real arm might be. That makes much more sense. God doesn't really speak. Humans speak. God said, let there be light, light vayehi or. Now that's talking. You try it. <laughs> try it. Say. <laughs> Say to your children, let's have quiet. <laughs> Say it ten times. Say it a hundred times. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. 
So who really talks? Humans or God? God doesn't get angry. I get angry. No, I don't get angry. I lose control. <laughs> a very different thing. I blow a fuse. That's not anger. God gets angry like a mensch. His anger is real. I don't know who to blame, and it doesn't really matter. How did this thing get so twisted, upside down, that we are the real thing, and he is, uh, maybe, maybe. This is not, this is not Torah. This is too much religion. I'm sitting here, I'm real, I'm trying to figure out whether he is. That's exactly like a husband who says, I'm married, when I get married, it's for real, I'm responsible, when I say I'm married, I am married, I am your husband, you don't know what marriage means. For me, the marriage is real. You don't take it seriously. That's what we say to God. I'm real. I don't know about you. So when Judaism became a religion, everything went down. Everything went down. Another problem. When it becomes a religion, no two people can agree. If it's my religion, I have to defend it. And if you don't agree, well, I'm just going to have to kill you. It's horrible. There's another thing. Religion demands that you dumb down. Don't ask too many questions. It's going to ruin the religion. You have to have faith. You have to believe. You have to accept. You have to bow. You have to close your eyes. And Nobody wants that. Especially not God. Then there's another problem. Religion makes you dependent and needy. That's all you ever hear from religion. You need, you must, you can't without God. You have to pray to him. You have to beg. You have to cry. Maybe, maybe he'll help you. Maybe he'll give you a little success. Otherwise, you're in trouble. It's not a good message. So I was talking to this reform rabbi. He says, why don't you agree with, why can't you tolerate what, I'm, what, I'm, what I represent? I said, because you're too religious for me. <laughs> he says, what do you mean? You're much more religious. I said, no, I'm not. Judaism is not a religion. Orthodoxy is a religion. Conservative is a religion. Reform is a religion. And you're going to argue for the rest of your life what this religion demands. 613 mitzvahs, or just smile and be nice to your neighbor. But that's the debate. What is the religion? You're both wrong. There is no religion. <laughs> In fact, how many religious Jews were there at Mount Sinai? <laughs> and what is the Torah's word for religion? Hmm? There's no word, right? There's no word for religion. When God came down to Mount Sinai, he wasn't telling you what to do. You hear this? When God came down to Mount Sinai, he did not tell us what to do. He told us what he needs. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. God has needs? I have needs. <laughs> you have needs? Like you have temper? Like you speak? Like you have an arm? You have needs? You remember what you needed last year? <laughs> and now it's a joke. You don't need it? Your needs are real? At best for 90 years after that, 
God has real needs. We are created in his image, so we also have something like a need. His need is real. So here's the message. The first words in the Torah tell you pretty much all you need to know. Bereshit bara elokim. What does that mean? In the beginning, God created. What does it mean, in the beginning? The beginning of what? Beginning of the book? <laughs> no. In the beginning means before there was you. And you had no needs. He created the world. Conclusion? Conclusion? He needs. How did I become the needy one? That's why this guy who is suing his parents for giving birth to him without his consent, he's right. He's so right. <laughs> you give birth to me and I have to get a job? <laughs> Excuse me. You gave birth to me. You pay the bills. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that the American way? I didn't ask for this. You didn't consult with me. You didn't get my permission. You went ahead and gave birth to me. And now I have to go to school. I have to get a job. I have to pay a mortgage. I have to pay taxes. No, I don't. God decides to create me in the beginning. And now I have to be religious. It doesn't make any sense. If God created me, then he needs me more than I need him. Is that shocking? I was introduced to this uh, minister in Minnesota. And uh, first, th first words out of his mouth. So do you believe in the Savior? And he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't being nasty or antagonistic. He just wanted to clear the air. He says, so do you believe in the Savior? I said, I, I don't know. But I'm not looking for a God who is going to serve me. I'm looking for a God who I can serve. The man started to cry. Middle-aged guy started to cry. And he says, you know, I never thought of that. Never thought of that. How is it you look at God as your savior? He's, he's your valet. He is there to take care of your needs. Isn't that backwards? Started to cry. We are realizing today, as we get closer to Moshiach, we are realizing that something is upside down in this world. Olam hafuch. He needs nothing and I have a bunch of needs. But then again, he's there to help me with my needs, which he gave me. <laughs> so he creates me with problems. Then he says, oh, you have a problem? Pray to me. Maybe I'll help you. <laughs> Something smells bad. It's not like that at all. God created the world. He is needy. For real. Forever. His need will never change. And it will inevitably be, be fulfilled. Because his needs, like everything else about him, are perfect. They are perfect needs, not handicaps. <clears throat> Let's talk about ourselves a little bit. Uh, a human being needs to eat. No? I need to eat. It's not true. It's not correct. If you think you need to eat, you're in trouble. 
because you need to stop eating, but you can't. Not true? I'm not talking about dieting. Anything you eat will make you ill. If you didn't have to eat, you would live forever. So I have to eat like a hole in the head. I have to be free of the need to eat. But I can't. This is not my need. It's not my idea. And it's not a need. It's a handicap. So God designed us in such a way that we need to eat and we need to sleep and we need to have a roof over our heads and we need security and we need love and we need all sorts of stuff. But he didn't ask us. Because if he did, uh, we would never have agreed. If you designed yourself would you make yourself dependent on food? Where you first have to wash off the worms, the bugs on the lettuce. You're in competition with insects. They want the fruit and you want the fruit. Who gets it first? Is this not embarrassing? Would you design yourself this way? If you were designing yourself, would you work in this, um, this system where half your life you have to sleep? Never. So what does it mean, I need to sleep? <laughs> I need to wake up. God designed me this way because he needs it this way. So I don't need to eat he needs me to eat. So I eat. But then God says, I also need you to put on filling. No. <laughs> then don't eat either. They're both his idea. In fact, when you say, I need to eat, that's idolatry. Why are you taking something that belongs to God and claim that it's yours? God needs you to eat. And you say, no, I need to eat. Nasty. Arrogant. You're not God. So look at what's happening to our world. We are... We are evolving. We are coming to some truths where the, the light is dawning and we are realizing things that we never realized before. And it's godly. It's godly. In the olden days, you tell a child, you, you have to go milk the cow. It's four o'clock in the morning. You have to milk the cow. So he went to milk the cow. You got to bring the eggs in from the chicken coop. He brought the eggs in. You got to plow. It, the season is late. If you don't plow now, you're going to be... Okay, fine. Then they plowed. And now you have to seed. And now you have to harvest. Because if you leave it too long... There were so many things you had to do. Today it's a little different. You don't have to milk the cow, but you have to get up in time for the school bus. You're going to miss the bus. You're four. You're four years old and you have to get on the bus. And you have to get a good report card and you have to graduate and get into a good college and you have to get a job and you have to make money and then you have to spend that money and then you have to pay taxes on that money. Not a little too much. <laughs> Somehow, it's worked up until today. It worked. How did we make any progress at all? How did we, how did we develop the, the Industrial Revolution? Because you had to. 
Today, people are saying, excuse me, I don't have to. You can't threaten me anymore. I don't have to. Well, if you don't do that, you're not going to have money. You won't be able to buy a house. So, what are you going to do? Live on the street? You're going to die from pneumonia. Don't threaten me. I don't have to. Isn't it true? Don't have to. Unless I want to live. <laughs> That's a different story. But I don't have to, right? I didn't ask to be born. So when all of these burdens become a little too much, so you seek help and relief, you go for therapy. <laughs> and what do they tell you in therapy? You're suffering from anxiety. That's the least of your problems. Your mother never wanted you. Uh, you know, your brother is your parents' favorite. You have so many more needs than you think, and it's going to take a lifetime to fix it. So you say, thank you very much. This is not what I came here for. So you figure, where am I going to find relief? Religion. <laughs> what a mistake that is. You come to any religion. They don't relieve you of needs. They give you more. What, you think when you die it's over? <laughs> so people are saying, I've had it. I've had it. A religious father or grandfather says to his grandson, you have to put on tefillin. You have to keep Shabbos. You have to make a bracha. You have to dress modestly. It used to work. I don't know why. I don't know how. Today, it doesn't make any sense. Now, the grandchild says, what do you mean I have to? I don't have to. What is the grandfather saying? You have to. No, I don't. Calm down. I don't have to. What are you talking about? Of course you have to. You'll go to hell. Oh. Blackmail. <laughs> Intimidation. Threats. That's it. I quit. Now, who's right? It's a, you know, if you're religious, this will destroy you. The grandfather says you have to. The grandchild says, no, I don't. Who's right? The grandson. He's right. He doesn't have to. You'll go to hell. I'll take my chances. I'll be with my friends. What's the problem? <laughs> Did you ever think of going to heaven? Seriously. You want to go to heaven? Who are you going to talk to? What are you going to talk about? What? You don't want to go there. So there's a whole plan. You'll avoid going to hell. You'll go to heaven. S skip it. Don't go anywhere. Stay right here. This is the best place. Because here you can do something for God. That's called life. If I can serve I am alive. If I need to be served, I might as well be dead. So Chai Elul, listen to this. Chai Elul means, will you stop being needy? It's an illusion. You don't need anything you didn't ask to be born. So why are you here? Did you ever hear of a creator? He created you. And you need him? No. 
He needs you. What does he need you for? He needs you. Yeah, what for? Don't change the subject. He needs you. What does he need me for? We're not communicating. He doesn't need you for. He needs you. You know what that's called? Intimacy. He just needs you. A man says to me, I love everything about my wife. Huh? Pretty good husband. I said, yeah, but I spoke to your wife last week and she's very unhappy. <laughs> so something doesn't add up. You love everything about her and she's miserable? What's going on? I don't know. She's crazy. So you don't love everything about her. I love everything about her. I said, but do you love her? He said, I love everything about her. He said, not about her. Do you love her? He says, what about her? <laughs> I said, not about her. Do you love her? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. Is that sad? Oh, so sad. I'm religious. I keep Shabbos. I keep kosher. I keep Hall of Yisrael. I keep special, you know, glot kosher. I, I keep uh, four days Rosh Hashanah. You know, I'm really orthodox. Yeah, but does God need you? No, I do everything. But does he need you? There's nothing I won't do. For whom? For the religion. When a man says, I decided I'm going to be a good husband. You know his wife is in trouble. <laughs> She's going to suffer. Because he's going to be a good husband. To whom? I read the book. I know how to be a perfect husband. Whose husband? Not important. Not important. If you are a good husband, you are doing many good things. That's not intimate. Are you bonding with her? What about her? We are not communicating. What does God want from you? He doesn't want from you. He wants you. For what? Stop it. For what means he doesn't really want me. He just wants to get something out of me. No, he doesn't. He just wants you. Why does he just want you and not something from you? Because he's perfect. He doesn't need something. Like a husband who is perfect and doesn't need anything. And when you need nothing, then you're ready to get married. Because now all you need is her because you're perfect all you need is him because otherwise you're perfect here's the punchline if i need you and not something from you and for whatever reason you're not available what am i missing you do you see what i'm saying how am I imperfect by needing you? Imperfect means if I don't get what I need, I will be missing something. What am I missing if I need you and you're not there? I'm not missing anything. You're missing in my life. Or I miss you not something and if you want to appreciate what this feels like when your husband is out of town do you miss him what do you miss about him no not something about him he, he's not here i miss him 
Your wife is out of town. You miss her? What do you miss most about her? Her. She's not here. I don't like that. Problem is, as soon as she walks in the door, <laughs> all of a sudden it's about something. Oh, good. Now you can... Oh, you're back? Okay, take out the garbage. Wouldn't it be nice if we can miss each other even when we're home? That we can actually appreciate the fact that you are in my life and I don't need you to do anything more than that. Would that not be perfect? That's called intimate. Intimate means the magical godly talent that we have, that we can break our own surface tension and merge and flow into another person's surface tension and become one. Like two drops of water. You break the tension, they're one drop of water. You break the tension between yourself and God and you become one. That's all he wants. Be one with me. Be mine. And that's what we mean when we say Hashem Echad. Not there's one God. Of course there's one God. You don't have to say that three times a day. Hashem Echad means all God wants is to become one with us. What was he before he created the world? If you appreciate a little Hebrew. Before he created the world, he was Yachid. He was the only. He doesn't like that. He wants to be one inclusively. When everything becomes part of holiness, when everything becomes his kind of world, then so the Jew who does not come to the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, God doesn't need him anymore? Or does he need him a little more? So what's with all the mitzvot? Do we have to do them? No, he needs us to do them. Why? Isn't it enough that I'm Jewish and I am his? You are Jewish and you are his. Why don't you come home? Why don't you come sit at the Shabbos table when he is sh sitting at the Shabbos table? So when God says keep Shabbos, he's saying, look at me. I'm keeping Shabbos. You're not going to come to the table with me? <laughs> so the mitzvah is not an end in itself. The mitzvah means, I'm Shabbos, Dick. Come with me. I'm kosher. Come with me. Everything God says in the Torah is autobiographical. He's describing himself. Even when he says, honor your father and mother. So, yeah, I really should do that. I really need to do that. Otherwise, I won't be in the will. God says, I don't know about your needs. I need you to honor your parents. Which is really good news. You know why? Because I don't have to. Imagine if everyone in the world wakes up tomorrow morning and says, I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to anything. I am free as a bird. But what do I do now? So God comes along and says, well, I have some needs. And to us, that is the best news of the day. Really? You need something from me? I'm so glad to hear that because otherwise I got nothing to do because <laughs> I don't need anything. 
So the only way my life makes any sense is if he needs me. It's the only sensible possibility to justify or explain my existence. No more hiding behind my needs. I don't have any. So when God calls Avraham, what does Avraham say? Hineni. You know what that means in English? I'm unemployed. <laughs> Hineni. Give me something to do. I got, I got nothing to do here. Because I didn't ask to be born. So if you need me, that is the best news I've ever heard. So this is what's happening in preparation for Moshiach. We have become unburdened. I don't have to. I am not depressed. I am not, I am not resentful. I am not overburdened. Nothing. Nothing. Don't threaten me because I didn't ask to be born. And on the other hand, he needs me. He? The creator of the universe needs me? Got a phone call from a man in Israel. I don't know him. He doesn't know me, but he's got a problem. He's looking for a solution. His 12-year-old daughter got it into her head that God was angry at her. And she's depressed. And they tried everything. Kabbalah, red strings, uh, psychology, psychiatry. And he puts her on the phone, which I really appreciate. 12-year-old girl puts her on the phone. So I said, uh, God is angry at you? She says, yeah. I said, I'm so jealous. She says, what? I said, I'm so jealous. You're 12 years old and you can get God angry? How did you become so important? If God is angry at us, don't you hear the compliment? He is the creator of the world. He is eternal. He is infinite. All powerful. And you upset him. This is not a compliment. First of all, uh, he noticed. He noticed what I did. It matters to him what I did. He's angry. That's why last week when we read or this week when we read all the curses. Do you know what people do after they finish reading all those curses in synagogue? What do they do afterwards? Ever see anybody run home crying? <laughs> after reading those pages after page after page of curses and threats and punishment and suffering and misery, we go into the Kiddush Hall, eat a kichel, a little herring, say l'chaim, go home. Did you hear what it says there? Yes. He can get very angry at us. Aren't we special? It's a compliment. Anyway, her problem went away. She goes over to her friends now and says, God is angry at me. <laughs> Not God is angry at me. No, God is angry at me, not at you. You're not important. <laughs> In our relationship with God, we are so thrilled to hear that he needs us because that's the only thing that makes sense anymore. So now, if do es Hashem b'simcha. If you're trying to satisfy your needs, you'll never be besimcha. But if ivdu es Hashem, you're doing what he needs from you, that's a pleasure. I'd much rather do you a favor than suffer my needs. So here's the Hasidic summation. Free choice 
you have freedom of choice. Not between sinning and not sinning. That's ridiculous. The free choice is you can be needy or you can be needed. Needy is depressing. Needed is simcha. So even if you're doing tshuva, even if you're asking God to forgive you for your sins, you should do it besimcha, because he cares. He needs you back home. He's waiting for you to come back home. So don't come home crying. Come home besimcha. What could be a greater joy than coming home? That's what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. People are going to wake up and say, I don't need anything. I hope he does. And if he does, let's find out what he needs. That's it. That's a Mashiach Dike world. When people will be asking only one question, what does he need from me? It's a happy question. It's a Mashiach Dike question. And that is the new life that the Baal Shem Tov and Chabad, the Alter Rebbe, breathed into Jewish thinking, into Jewish life. It's not a religion. Religion is your need. Torah is his need. Serve him with joy. Amen. Different, no? You should all have a great new year. God needs you to have a great new year, so he will certainly give it to you. Don't beg. Don't quetch. Don't be miserable. Tell him you're going to use the year he gives you to serve him properly. That's intimacy. And that's how a marriage should be. So our marriages should be just us, no thing. Judaism means just us, no thing. And if you're not home, I don't need you any less. I need you more. Thank you for listening. Shana Tova. A good, sweet year.